Hello, my name is Dr. Paul Dean, and um, I've been teaching the Bible for a number of years. I've served a number of churches, and I've taught in seminaries and colleges, and I've got uh, some credentials that we could talk about perhaps, but that's out there on the web if you're interested. But I just want to talk about worldview for a little bit, and so I thought I'd do a few sessions. Um, it's uh, a topic of critical importance. Really, ultimately, when you think about worldview, it's a matter of life and death. It's an issue. It's a topic that has eternal significance. Uh, everyone has a worldview. The question is, do you have the right worldview? Do you have the true worldview? Because there's only one worldview that is ultimately true. There's only one worldview that makes sense out of our reality, that makes sense out of our world, that makes sense out of our experience, that makes sense out of um, the way people live and the way people behave. And uh, obviously we're talking about a biblical worldview. We're talking about a worldview that's rooted in the revealed truth of uh, God, the, the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. But as we just sort of wade into our thoughts, we're just going to be talking about worldview uh, in general. There uh, are three major worldview categories that I want to highlight as, again, we wade into this. And uh, I want to give Darrow Miller uh, credit uh, for sort of breaking these, uh, or, or breaking us into these categories because there are a number of categories that we could talk about. I mean, globally there are hundreds of religions and thousands of philosophies. And uh, as Dr. Miller says, what we have to do is distill all of that uh, into some kind of manageable form and, and we need to get down to a worldview level. And uh, uh, he illustrates it this way, you know, if you think about um, the fact that soda, you know, like Pepsi or Coca-Cola, um, milk, uh, and wine, uh, you can ask the question, what, what do these three uh, beverages have in common? Well, obviously, they're all liquid, but they're, they're very different. But there are, there are different kinds of wines and different kinds of sodas and different kinds of uh, milk products, but again, we can sort of distill all of that into those three categories, wine, soda, milk, etc. Uh, James Anderson suggests that there are four basic worldviews, for example, monotheism, pantheism, polytheism, and atheism, and that's a good way to break things down. Uh, Summit Ministries, uh, big into worldview issues, they break worldview down into six categories, uh, biblical Christianity, Islam, secular humanism, Marxism, Leninism, uh, Marxism, Leninism would be the same thing essentially, uh, cosmic humanism and postmodernism. And again, I could talk about all of these. That's, that's not the point of what I'm trying to do uh, uh, here at this particular time, just trying to you know, talk about the need to, to break these things down. James Sire, for example, uh, gives us nine worldview categories to wrestle with. Christian theism, Deism, naturalism, nihilism, existentialism, Eastern pantheistic monism, uh, New Age, which is essentially spirituality without religion, postmodernism, Islamic theism. Uh, but obviously, nine categories is fairly cumbersome if you think about it, though we have to deal with all of those. Uh, Richard Lombard of uh, Worldview U suggests three basic worldviews theism, atheism, and pantheism. And so again, people are trying to sort of distill the hundreds of religions and thousands of worldviews out there. Uh, Freddie Davis of Market Faith Ministries, he's got five categories. Naturalism, animism, uh, Far Eastern thought, theism, relational revelation. But as Dr. Miller points out, most writers uh, drive the subject to the academic and the abstract. And, and and you, and you can even feel that or sense that as I've just sort of read through some um, worldview categories, you know, the way in which folk break things down. But the truth of the matter is, uh, practically speaking, and Darrell Miller is huge on this, and I've learned a great deal uh, in this particular application or area, uh, practically speaking, ideas have consequences. And he's not the first one that said that, and we all understand that, but think about that for just a minute. Ideas have consequences. And so there are practical implications from each basic worldview. And Miller just 
focuses on three basic worldviews. All of those things that we've mentioned and the hundreds of positions that we have not mentioned can all really fall under one of three headings. You have uh, Christian theism, uh, you have atheism, and of course if you think about atheism, secularism falls under that, atheistic materialism, naturalism, on we could go. So you have Christian theism, you have atheism, and then you have animism. And Dr. Miller uses these uh, three categories for two reasons. One of those reasons, as I've already alluded to, is, um, is practical. Uh, in most cultures um, where poverty uh, has flourished, uh, Dr. Miller uh, spent a number of years, almost 30 years, uh, working in Christian relief organizations, doing missions work overseas, different countries around the world, a lot of impoverished countries. And he discovered, uh, of course, we're, we're not basing anything that we're going to teach on what we discover, uh, general revelation, you know, powers of observation. The authority for what we believe and what we teach, uh, of course, is the Word of God. But we do learn things, and, and one of the things that he learned is that, again, most impoverished um, cultures uh, were animistic in their worldview. And so you begin to think about the implications of animism, and then you begin to see a connection between animism and why it is that people in those cultures are poor. Um, when, he, when he's talking about uh, impoverished cultures that are influenced by animism, that would include the animistic peoples of Africa, of Asia, of Central and South America, but also uh, the folk animism that's found in Islam and Hinduism and Buddhist cultures, for example. And essentially, animism puts up barriers uh, to both economic and holistic development, holistic, spiritual, uh, mental, physical well-being, that kind of thing. Here's what Darrell Miller says. He says, The relief and development industry in which I served for 27 years largely functioned from an atheistic, materialistic set of assumptions. Now, again, he's talking about working in cultures that are animistic, and yet the Christian organization that he worked with to help these folk was essentially um, materialistic in nature, uh, atheistic materialistic. Not that they were atheists, but that's the kind of the the worldview they operated from. And that's what we have to understand. That you may be a Christian, but you may be operating from a non-Christian worldview in this particular area of your life, just as non-Christians operate from a biblical worldview in certain areas of their lives, even though they don't realize it. But regardless, you know, he says that the organizations that he that he worked with function with this atheistic, materialistic worldview, as it were, a set of assumptions, at least in in the area that they were uh, working and, you know, helping folk who are poor, um, essentially uh, it was largely defined by, you know, what they did was largely defined by uh, a materialistic analysis of the causes and solutions, uh, causes of poverty and solutions to poverty. And so he says too often that, you know, the industry solutions uh, for hunger and for poverty um, relied on a redistribution of resources only, you know, having people donate and then giving to the poor, and that's it. Um, obviously, and, and this is what he comes to, this is the conclusion he comes to, such an approach generates unintended consequences like dependency and ultimately greater poverty. So the root cause of the poverty, he says, was an animistic worldview. And then he was driven to see that atheistic materialistic solutions, obviously, didn't solve the problem. Only the Christian worldview, and we'll just put it this way, the worldview of reality, the true worldview, only the Christian worldview uh, has the metaphysical capital. Now that's a phrase, metaphysical capital. In other words, if you're an atheist, naturalist, all you... All you believe that exists is the physical realm. You know, they believe the universe is a box, and, and there's nothing outside the box, there's nothing beyond the physical, and the only thing that's real and the only thing that's truth or true 
uh, is that which we can perceive with our five senses. You know, what we can see and smell and taste and touch and hear. And if it's beyond that, then um, it, it's not real. Uh, we're not allowed to go outside of the box uh, for answers to, to life's questions. Now, they contradict themselves as a side issue because they certainly believe in immaterial things. One example would be laws of logic. Uh, they, they freely use and affirm laws of logic, but they have no explanation on their worldview where laws of logic come from. Laws, are lo laws of logic are not physical. They're, they're immaterial. They're beyond the physical. They're metaphysical. Uh, yet they're real and they exist. Laws, you know, A cannot be non-A at the same time. That's a law, for example. Now, I don't want to get too far afield. But what we're saying is that y you've got to have uh, power. You've got to have currency. I'm using that metaphorically. You've got to have capital. <coughs> Let me put it this way. Ideological capital or metaphysical capital you got to have the right kind of metaphysical capital to solve the, the very real problems of hunger and poverty. you got to have a worldview that helps you to understand where hunger and poverty come from and how to, how to solve those problems. So that's what we're talking about, metaphysical capital. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you know, that's a practical reason for... Um, you know, sort of breaking worldview, all the thousands of worldviews out there, for breaking it down into, into three broad categories, um, animism, materialistic atheism, and then biblical Christianity. Um, Darrell Miller offers a philosophical argument as well. He essentially says, that all religions and all philosophies actually can be distilled uh, into three basic worldviews. Uh, animism, for example, essentially says that all of reality is ultimately spiritual. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, atheism says that reality, and I alluded to this a moment ago, atheism says that reality is ultimately physical. And then, of course, the biblical worldview says that here's what reality is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, that's a Christian worldview. God exists outside of time and space. God exists outside of the box. He exists outside of uh, uh, the known, the physical universe, the universe which scientists say had a beginning. Of course, we understand that. And God spoke and the universe came to be. In fact, uh, Job tells us that God hung the world on nothing. So, uh, all worldviews can be broken down into, you know, uh, one of those three categories. So, let's talk about animism just uh, for a moment. Uh, you, you can break animism down into two subcategories with a myriad or a ton of uh, subsets under that. But the two broad categories would be uh, polytheism and pantheism and under polytheism obviously what we're talking about there is multiple deities multiple finite deities um, multiple personal finite deities and so you have the traditional animistic religions uh, the African traditional religions ancient Greek religion ancient Roman religion Old Testament deities like Baal uh, Shintoism, Mormonism, the, these are polytheistic religions and they're, they're animistic at, at, at their essence, at their core. Uh, the second category, as I mentioned, under animism would be pantheism, and that's the worldview that says the universe is one impersonal spirit. So again, polytheism, uh, multiple, finite, personal deities... Pantheism, uh, the universe is just an impersonal spirit, and there's only one. Uh, monism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, New Age, uh, you might remember um, Avatar, uh, 
uh, Gaia, Gaia worship, Earth worship, which is really what radical environmentalism is rooted in. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Force, you know, in the United States and I guess in other parts of the world. Um, Star Wars is very popular. Well, uh, that's, that's, you know, that's pantheism. That's what it is. And, um, you know, in the West, it's interesting, uh, materialism, you know, modernism was sort of the, the primary worldview that, that, that sort of held our culture captive for many, many years. And, you know, the notion that science has all the answers to life's questions, and that gave way to postmodernism. Uh, because science doesn't have all the answers to life's questions. And so this um, atheistic materialism, um, you know, it's sort of uh, spiraling down and other dynamics are replacing it. And this postmodern world now that's filled, you know, this filled, filling the West, I should say, um, it's turning to pantheism for answers. Um, so anyway, that's uh, animism. Uh, atheism, of course, so again, we're talking about these three broad worldview categories, animism, atheism, and then biblical Christianity. <coughs> Excuse me. Atheism, as I said a few moments ago, ultimately uh, sees the, uh, the universal reality as physical, physical only, denies God, denies any spiritual reality. And some of the, um, you know, categories that you could find under uh, atheism would be naturalism, secularism, secular humanism, Darwinism, evolution, uh, reductionism, fascism, Nazism, communism, we could go on. And of course there's a radical alternative to, to those worldviews, to those categories. And um, you, you know, atheism, everything's physical. Animism, everything's spiritual. Uh, the radical alternative to that is monotheism. And um, under monotheism, you have two essential headings. You've got Unitarian monotheism, sees God as a single, individual, undivided, infinite person, and sees this God as the creator of the universe. You'd find that in Judaism, Deism, Universalism, Islam, Moral Theism, those kinds of things. So that's a Unitarian view of monotheism. But then you've got the Trinitarian view, and Trinitarians understand that God is a combined one or a united one. And obviously we're talking about the Trinitarian God, the only true and living God, the God who has revealed himself in the Old and New Testaments, one God who exists in three persons. And obviously you find that in Christianity. Uh, I guess you could say you find that in ancient Judaism, you know, talking about uh, the Old Testament before contemporary Judaism rejected the Messiah. But uh, essentially we're talking about Christianity. And so this philosophical side of the discussion, uh, Dr. Miller points out, helps us to distill all of these uh, religions and worldviews and philosophies into those basic three, animism, atheism, Christian theism. But ultimately, that's, that's not the critical issue. That's not really what's ultimate. What's ultimate is what we said before, and that is that ideas have consequences. And worldviews, and, and we may or may not talk about this a little bit further, but, but a worldview is how we view the world. It's the sum total of our presuppositions and our assumptions. And a lot of it we just take for granted without evidence, and a lot of it we're very intentional about what we believe, and we've analyzed certain things. But it's the, it's the, it's the total of, of what we believe and, and how we interpret life and how we go about our lives. Uh, it's the lens through which we look at everything. But worldviews not only determine how we view the world, and I've already sort of alluded to that in that little uh, definition there, but, but practically speaking, worldviews determine the kinds of communities and or the kinds of societies that we will build as human beings. Um, worldviews will determine the kinds of um, responses that we will have for uh, 
very practical issues like the ones that we've already talked about, hunger and poverty in our world. And as I you know, gave you this little phrase earlier, metaphysical capital, metaphysical capital is the key to solving the issues of hunger and poverty. Um, the animate, here's what I mean by that, here in, in is Dr. Miller, I'm just distilling him. Uh, animism leads to underdevelopment. Um, folk are subject to the fates, as it were, and they're subject to what they believe is, uh, you know, spirits, and, 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 you know, they, they, they don't believe a lot of the time in being able to change their situation. You know, if the spirits have already brought bad upon them, they're going to remain in that bad state, and they just don't do anything about it. And we could go on, but that's essentially what I'm saying. Um, so animism leads to underdevelopment. Uh, atheism limits the analysis of poverty, as, as Darrow Miller pointed out. It, 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 it limits the analysis of poverty and its solutions to a materialistic perspective. Hey, we just got to give to folk. But the biblical worldview is, is, is providing metaphysical capital for the comprehensive development of individuals, communities, and nations. For example, it's not just taken from one person and given to somebody else. It's not just taxation or donation or whatever. It's not a zero-sum game. We have the ability to, to learn, to think, and to, to create. We don't create out of nothing like God does, but we create out of what God has given us. And God has called us to be vice regents over His creation. He's called us to be creators and innovators. And, and so, so we discover new sources of energy and new ways to build things. And, and we come up with new solutions to problems. Problems force us into to research and investigation and trial and error. And we can equip people to, to overcome the, the, the circumstances in which they find themselves. We can teach them from a worldview perspective. God doesn't want you to wallow in your poverty, for example. And we're not talking about a health wealth gospel either. That's a totally different dynamic. But what we're talking about, the fact is that God has given us brains. He's given us a dominion mandate. He's told us to subdue the earth. He's told us to, to cultivate. He's told us to, to pull the resources out that he's given us. And he's told us to build and go to the moon. He hasn't told us specifically to go to, go to the moon. But these are all results of, of, the, of taking control and subduing the earth. And, and that's a result of the mandate or one of the mandates that God has given us. And as we do that, it's not just for material gain and it's not just for better lives. Though we do gain materially and we do have better lives, hospitals make life better than before there were hospitals, right? But we do it for the glory of God. We are imaging forth God. And we're creating His image and we're doing what what God does, and, and, and no other worldview has that kind of metaphysical capital. And so that's what we're talking about as we wade into this uh, vast subject, of which we're only going to be able to scratch the surface, but as we wade into this vast subject of worldview.